Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Welsh Republic podcast, episode 74 today. And I am here with my guest, the front, the front porch conservative. How are you doing today, mate? Welsh Republic, I am very well. Thank you. How stands things on the other side of the pond? It's okay, dude. It's actually approaching summertime here in New Zealand. It's spring. I mean, it's very, it was a bit hot outside today, but still up and down. You know, what? what's the weather like where you're at? It is, it's almost Scottish. It's rainy and it's cold and it's damp and it aches the bones. And I keep saying, we're summer. I want my summer back. So, but otherwise we're fine. Um, not dealing with Bless their hearts, the problems they have down in Florida right now with hurricanes. So, so on the whole, yeah, it is. It does look pretty bad there, you know, at the moment, yeah. especially, you know, with a lot of bad stuff. But hey, at least, you know, Florida's dealing okay. They're very strong. A lot of people are coping with it, you know, what well, might, might like not as, you know, as good as people suggest. But what else have you been up to today? Uh, well, uh, I am more or less recovering from a head cold. I hope I'm, I hope I sound okay. Uh, but aside from that, I've just been lounging around the house, you know, trying to keep up with what's going on in the aftermath of the elections, you know, clenching my fists, gritting my teeth, trying to figure out what in the world happened. Because I, I've i been following American politics since I was 17 years old. I'm 50 now. And what I watched go down you Tuesday actually night. Look six, you actually look about 11 years younger. Oh, you're my new favorite person. God bless you, sir. <laughs> you actually do. You do look at, you know, 11 years young. You look good for your age. Well, thank you. I genuinely appreciate that. Um, and that, and you can circulate that compliment uh, to Miss Gigi Dior. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I mean, what I watched go down Tuesday night is one of the most bizarre things and i'm still gonna be i'm gonna be spending time analyzing this for probably days and weeks because all the old metrics that i would have used to, to predict what was going to happen just got wadded up and thrown in the trash can because if you take an unpopular president who's polling in the low 40s record high inflation a job market that is sketchy at best supply chain problems, a disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. Take all that together in what is his and first... And also the the drama surrounding you know, Hunter Biden and all the oh, accusations yeah, going on with Ukraine, you know, and all the money that's given to Ukraine, which is very unconstitutional. Yeah, if you take all that together and you factor in that this is this president's first midterm election, I would have said, and I and I this was the consensus among everybody. At a minimum, the Republicans would probably pick up 35 to 40 seats in the House of Representatives, and they'd probably net gain three Senate seats. Hmm. Then election night happened. And I went, What? I was like, what just happened? I have no idea. I'm it was starting. it kind of felt like, you know, two years ago. Just like the, you know, the things that were going on in Pennsylvania, you know, um, Georgia, how the ballots were pretty much counting and, you know, Trump, Trump was in the lead. And then all uh -huh. of a sudden, you know, everything just goes down. And then four days later, there's a glitter, there's a glitch or an ear in the pool's closed. And then, you know, especially with what happened in that county, what was the county that happened in where it started? Maricopa County, Arizona. And I should have realized when they made that announcement, I went, oh, God, here we go again. It just and and now here for, for your listeners, here's something that will blow your mind. The legislature in the state of Arizona is controlled in both chambers by the Republicans. There is a Republican governor. There's a Republican attorney general. They've had from 2020 till last Tuesday to fix this. They could have passed a law. The governor could have signed it. They could have tightened up the election rules, everything. They did nothing, nothing to prevent what happened Tuesday night. Let me rephrase that. From what happened in 2020, from happening again last Tuesday night. And I got bad news for Governor Doug Ducey and for uh, the attorney general out there, Mark Burnovich. 
If you guys think you've got a career, future career in politics in America, just forget it. Because after what you guys let happen, you guys couldn't be elected dog catcher. All right. That's how badly you guys have stained your reputations. So it was crazy. Yeah, I just saw a news on the Gateway Pundit this morning that said once again, another Democrat takes the lead after four days of delayed ballot counting yeah. and race is immediate call. I, I, I just look at this front porch and I just think that when you look at a lot of the voting laws in the United States, and I was in I was on a show with this girl called Megan Fox, not the actress. She's another yeah. girl called Megan yeah. Fox. She's friends with Nick Ricada. Very good. Just check her out. She does a lot of, you know, programs like investigating like childhood grooming that is going on in schools and stuff. And she said that these this counting shouldn't be happening like as much as it did in the county you mentioned and in Arizona and Nevada and some other states in California, which was absolutely ridiculous. I think it's one thing that really annoys me is how in Europe they seem to have stricter voting laws. Even in India, India has stricter voting for laws than they do in, in India and Europe. Well, you can argue maybe it does happen, but in most European countries, the voting is very strict. They do very strict things to make sure, you know, voter fraud doesn't happen. You as you as an American, when you hear the American government go on about how oh, we're the land of the free, your vote matters and all that. But then this voter fraud, which has been happening, which has obviously been done by the Federal Reserve and the elitists and the bankers and stuff. Sure. When you see that. As an American, when you feel like your country should be the home, the land, and the free, but this stuff happens, how does that make you feel? It makes me sad because, frankly, of all the places in the world where this sort of thing is happening, this is the last place it ought to happen. Technologically speaking, I'm not going to sit here and tell you we're the best at everything, but technologically, there's no reason why it should take a week to count ballots. I mean, Florida, I'll just give you an example. Um, Florida has, I think, a population of 27 million, if I remember correctly. They have their results in and done in the same night. Now, 20 years ago, they had a lot of problems in the presidential election of 2000. It took them about, mm, call it 20 years off and on, to, to adjust their election laws they can do everything in one night. They have their votes counted. Everything's turned in. They have no problems. Arizona, Pennsylvania, Nevada have smaller populations than Florida, and it takes them a week. California, it, 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 might, be, it might be two more weeks before we have all the congressional races decided out there. This is madness. Now, part of that is the uniqueness of the American system in that each state has its own election laws. They control how certain offices are voted for. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But the argument that says, well, we can do what we want, take as long as we want, no, that is unacceptable. You are sowing distrust in the system. There are people right now who are screaming, fraud, 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 fraud. Now, will we ever know? I don't know. The only sure way to find out is a signature match verification. Now, will you get the states to do that? I have no idea. It should have happened in 2020 in certain states. It didn't. But it, to answer your question, it breaks my heart because this is tearing at the body politic in the worst sort of way. And it's not healthy for the country. Mm hmm. So when you look at all the countries, when they do like voting and counting, what state would you say does the best job of making sure election fraud doesn't happen? At this point, I'll argue Florida. They, I mean, I'd have to get back in to look at their specific laws, but they make sure that if you do vote by mail, okay, or let's say absentee ballot, your signature when you turn the ballot in, is verified against your signature on file. They don't have these problems anymore like they used to have. The votes are counted in one night, and by midnight, they're done. The polls close in Florida, 7 p.m. Eastern, and then 8 o'clock Eastern for the panhandle. 
and in two different time zones. They can have their results done and in by midnight, 1 a.m. Everything's counted. Everything's done. Everybody goes home. No problems. Florida does it better than anybody else. Now, ask me which state I think sucks the worst. Uh, right now, it's probably a toss-up between Pennsylvania and California. I mean, Philadelphia. Pennsylvania in 2020, the way that they were behaving, you know, especially when it was such a key state, you know, for like Trump to win. I think it was very, very immature, very silly. And I think the guy at that chart time when he was doing the election counting should have been arrested, you know, for what was going on. Because I remember seeing like Project Vertos videos a month after like the 2000 uh, election, 2020 election. And I just thought to myself, why, like, how, how is this being allowed to happen? Like, where are, like, the investigation? Why isn't there no, you know, people getting arrested? It was just absolutely insane. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'll never forget. On election night in 2020, I went to bed at about, eh, I guess it's maybe 1, one thirty in the morning. Trump had, like, a six-point lead in Pennsylvania. And I'm sitting here going, okay. There's still, you know, votes out, but that's fine. He's got enough of a margin. It won't matter. And then as the days dragged on, that lead just got whittled away, whittled away a little more each time. Every vote dump that came in. And and in the end, he wound up losing Pennsylvania by like, I think it was like 60,000 votes, I think. I have to go back and look at the exact number. Now. And that gets to something else that I'm just now starting to get into, or at least getting my eyes open on, and it starts to explain, in part, what happened Tuesday night, is that you have certain states that are run by Democrats, where they have gone full bore, vote by mail, okay? They have adopted it, they've embraced it, they've made it part of their get-out-the-vote effort, and... There is a profound difference, and it's, you know, like I said, it's just now dawning on me what's happened. There's a profound difference between an individual going to vote versus collecting a ballot. The Democrats have turned ballot collection, or if you want to use the term harvesting, they've turned this into a science. They can have votes done and in the bag going into election day and it allows them knowing what they've got they can target their resources and their monies more effectively to make sure they can get out the vote in other places i mean it, i mean selena zito who is a fabulous writer she's probably one of my favorites go-tos when it comes to understanding politics especially pennsylvania what would you what would you say is your favorite article that she's done Oh, gosh. It, well, it's not even so much one article as it's – she is what I call one of the last of the good shoe leather reporters. Um, she'll actually get out and travel the country. She's not sitting in some cubicle somewhere, you know, going to cocktail parties in Georgetown. And she'll actually get out and go to a local diner in, in western Pennsylvania or hang out at a barber shop in, in eastern Ohio she will actually talk to people and it's that sense of community it's that sense of i want to know what people are really thinking that to me separates her from a lot of individuals she wrote a book uh, it's probably about seven years ago now called the great revolt and it explains how it is that donald trump won the presidency and she's the one that came up with the the great line Trump's opponents take him literally, but they don't take him seriously. Trump's supporters take him seriously, but they don't take him literally. And that's the difference. And I went, that's pretty profound. It really was. But she's written an article recently about if the Republicans don't get their act together, they're going to be so far behind, so far behind they'll never win major races again. And that sort of gets to a question. Okay, let's assume that you adopt your opponent's tactic. 
you start, you know, going full all in on vote by mail. All right, let's say you win an election. Do you keep doing it for now until the end of time, or do you go in and change your state's laws and abolish it? I don't know. I don't know where this is going to lead, but definitely voting by mail that was implemented because of COVID has profoundly changed the way that elections are are done here in the U.S. And I don't know that's going to go away anytime soon. What, what do you think that when you look at COVID, when that came into play, the lockdowns and how they were like doing the voter the voter ballot and stuff, do you think that it, that this is another part of the plan of the new world order and the elitists to turn the United States from a like you know developed country to a third world country that's very divided and very because especially also when it comes to them how conspiracy theorists go on about how they want to build you know the authoritarian state do you think this is just another part of it with the voter ballot and stuff i think i think voting by mail has made it much easier for the democrats to achieve their goals now how well that ties into the new world order and klaus schwab and the world economic forum yet to be determined but it's quite obvious what the democrats are doing they used covid as the pretext to loosen up election laws that had been put in place for years around voter integrity. I'll give you an example. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania never had vote by mail until 2019, I think it was. They passed, their legislature passed, their governor, who was a Democrat, signed something called Act 77. It almost sounds like something out of you know Star Wars. Execute Order 77. Um, but basically what it did it just put no excuse vote by mail in place. Pennsylvania had never, in 200 years of history, never had that kind of law in place. But the Democrats said, "Oh, COVID, we don't want we want to, we want people to be able to vote, but we don't want them to be get infected." Well, all right, okay. Nobody realized what they were doing. I don't. Well, let me rephrase that. The majority of people didn't realize the profound effect it would have. Because like I said, I went to bed at one in the morning on election night, 2020. I'm thinking, okay, Trump's got Pennsylvania. He's got Michigan. He's got Georgia. He's got Arizona. You know, it might take him a few more days to count their votes, but it's in the bag. We've got this. Every day that went by, I'm like, one more state's getting picked off. One more state's getting picked off. It's just like Tuesday night. Adam Laxalt in Nevada had a 9,000 vote lead on the incumbent, Catherine uh, Masto Cortez. Today, because of the votes coming out of Clark County, Nevada, he lost the lead, lost the race, and now, no matter what happens in Georgia next month, the Republicans have no chance at all of reclaiming the chamber. None. Multi millions of dollars raised, multi millions of dollars spent. And this is the net result in a year when you should have won at least three seats, possibly four. And you can't even do that. You even lose a seat. This should not happen. Mm -hmm. As a person, since you say that you've been around, you know, watching American politics since you were 17 years old. When you look at like well, what happened in 2020 and 2022 with the amount of election fraud that we're seeing nowadays, and obviously, don't get me wrong, election fraud has been happening since in the since USA in 1864, like oh, the, sure. that documentary with Lila yeah. Hart and Eric did, which was a shout out to them. Very yeah. good documentary, a very cool documentary. I recommend everyone watching this go check it out. American voter fraud of history, very good. When you look at, like, throughout history, all the voter frauds that happened, would you say the voter fraud of 2020 and the midterms is the worst that there's ever been, or have you seen any other that is just worse? I don't know it's, if it's 2020 and 2022 were the worst, as much as it was a different kind of, with long-term repercussion. 
I can make an argument that the 1960 presidential election may have been one of the worst. Because I mean, yeah, with Nixon and John F. Kennedy, yeah, Nixon and yeah. John F. Kennedy, there were some people who literally thought that like Nixon had won, and there was this all the confusion. They had a lot of that confusion that happened. I mean, the the lengths that uh, Joseph Kennedy went to to get his son the presidency are astounding, and the stuff of legend. And here's the here's the part that you know, looking back on it, I understand why he did it. On the other hand. I really wish, looking back, he hadn't done it. Because there were people who went to Nixon. They said, look, we've got the Democrats dead to rights here. We can prove fraud in Chicago. Contest the election. Nixon, to his credit, wouldn't do it. He said, no. The country's spoken. We've had the election. You know, we're going to let it go. Now, I'm kind of that person that says, you know, if you give somebody an inch, they will take a mile. And the problem with giving the Democrats an inch, they won't just take a mile. They'll take the whole track. And you won't even get to walk on it anymore. I, I am to the point, no, when it comes to issues like voter integrity and tightening up election laws, I'm sorry. I don't like the idea of election month. I don't like the idea of, for any reason whatsoever, you can just throw a ballot in the mail. States have absentee voting laws. They've been on the books for decades. They have served the country well. There's no reason why those should be just tossed aside and say, here, here's ballots. I can't tell you the number of people who, I mean, go back to the 2020 election. Gary Beekler of Nerdrotic had moved out of San Francisco, was living in a place just outside San Diego, California. He and his wife got ballots mailed to their old residence in San Francisco. And not only were they mailed, uh, there were people who uh, hadn't lived at that house in years in San Francisco. Their ballots were mailed there. So now you've got probably five, six ballots going to an address that no one lives there, who knows what happens to them? You know, this is my problem with this. We're sowing, we are deliberately sowing distrust into the system to now, regardless of who wins the election, there's always going to be that nagging, how do I know you really won? How do I know you really won this election fair and square? I mean, you know, we're we're not doing ourselves any favors here. And the long term of this is it's just going to get worse if the American people don't have a reckoning on this issue. In other words, we can't figure out how to do this in a civil manner. This is going to get worse and it's not going to be good. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, you know, I um, when you look back at that, that time in history between John F. Kennedy and Nixon. Now, a lot of people say that Nixon was a bad president. He was rubbish and stuff. And John F. Kennedy was better. And John F. Kennedy wanted to end the Federal Reserve and he wanted to end the elitist, uh, the, you know, the bank system. A lot of people obviously do criticize Nixon for ending the gold standard, which was a very dumb move of him. In your opinion, if you had a choice right now to vote between Nixon and John F. Kennedy, who would you vote for? And who do you think would be better at fighting the globalist elite? I never thought I'd ever say this, but probably John F. Kennedy. <laughs> because when you look back through the haze of history, and you realize the things that JFK wanted to do but never got the chance, I'm sitting here wondering, you know, Nixon had his good points. But on domestic policy, John F. Kennedy, I think, would have been better had he lived. I mean, if nothing else, the 1964 election would have been profoundly different. You know, um, it would have been a discussion of ideas between he and Goldwater and, you know, I think the country would have been better served. But probably, it, all things being equal, I'd have voted for JFK. 
I really would have, knowing everything that we all know now. Yeah, no doubt in my mind, I probably would have. Mm -hmm. What do you think was the best thing that Nixon did as president? Getting us out of Vietnam. In my in my book, that was a war we never should have been involved in. And I'm not saying that per se because I'm anti-war. I understand that there are moments when nations must defend themselves and their interests. I get it. But honestly, that war had dragged on for almost eight or nine years. And we weren't winning. Our credibility was going right down the toilet. And Nixon said, we got to get out. Was it the best way that we did it? Probably not. But in the end, we got out. I mean, great nations, in one sense, are almost like great athletes. It's not one big injury that takes them down. It's just those slight, nagging, little aggravations that when you couple them together, they'll take a great athlete out of the game. Same thing with countries. Right now, the U.S. is beset on all sides by self-inflicted wounds that when you take them all together, I'm not saying that we're ready to fall, but we're definitely not enjoying the best period of our history. High inflation? Foreign entanglements, be they in Ukraine or other parts of the world, which the military-industrial complex and with the banking system of the Federal Reserve using the United States taxpayer dollars, and that is one of the reasons why the United States citizens needs to get rid of the Federal Reserve Act, because if you do that, you can get control of the United States dollar and bring back the gold standard and get them out of these stupid proxy wars that they're involved in. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's any number of things that when you take them all together, it's just dragging the country down. And, and, you know, you've heard the term managed decline. Well, that's what's going on right now. You have a border in the South that is wide open. The President of the United States and his um, Secretary of Homeland Security are doing nothing to stop it. Absolutely nothing. I mean, it's, it's you know, it amazes me that you can show people video of people crossing the border illegally every day. Immigration, Customs Enforcement, Border Security, they can't control it. They don't have enough manpower. And the policies that we put in place are just letting the border be overrun. And everybody knows this. Is the elite in Washington doing anything about it? Nope. Nope. Why? It benefits them to have cheap labor. And they're going to keep right on doing it until somebody brings a halt to it. I mean, there's a lot of things about Trump that you could say, but Trump understood something. If you can't control your own border, you're not a country. And if you go back and look at the statistics, when he left office, yeah, there were still people trying to cross the border in the South, but it was down to a trickle. That was manageable. Biden came in on day one and by executive order, start undoing everything. And then all the problems kicked into high gear. And it's like, we just spent four years getting this under control. And now you're undoing everything. And it just, the disconnect between the will of the American people and the elites that supposedly rule them is a chasm such that I have never seen this kind of divide. Never. It's it's just it's astounding to me. You know. And it was so my hope. Look, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Um, so when you look at the midterms right now, now, who would you say out of all the governors in the Republican side did the best job of fighting voter ballot rules at the best job of exposing the lies? And who do you think did the worst? With uh, with the Republicans, it's a tie for first place, but for different reasons. Actually, d despite DeSantis, despite DeSantis, and despite Ma Marjorie Taylor Greene. Okay, all right. Putting those two aside, Carrie Lake 
the woman who will be governor of Arizona, God willing, when this is all over with, Carrie Lake did more and has done more as a candidate to prove the problems in the current system out in Arizona and even nationally. And can you, if this is what she could do as a candidate, can you imagine what she does when she's sworn in as governor? Oh my goodness. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I what do you think very... she would do as governor? What do you think would be the first policy she would bring in? And what do you think she would do? Because she was a journalist for 26 years. What do you think she would do to fight against the mainstream media? I well, and big tech censorship. Yet to be determined, but on voter fraud, I mean, on, on voting systems, I know what she'll do almost immediately. This vote by mail stuff will be seriously curtailed. I'll be shocked if it's not in Arizona. And they're going to put in place systems where they can get their vote done and counted in one night. Um, with regard to journalism, I think the, the journalists in Arizona, <laughs> they're in for a very rude awakening dealing with this woman because Carrie Lake is going to be, unless I'm really disappointed down the road, Carrie Lake comes out of that environment. She comes out of modern American journalism. She knows what these people are going to do. She knows the tricks they're going to try and pull. I have a feeling if she stay, if she keeps her eyes open, she's going to be just fine. If nothing else, she will force these people to actually do honest journalism again. Because what's going to happen, excuse me, they're going to get the equivalent of this. She's going to verbally smack them. You know, she's going to, they'll try, they'll try something. She'll bring the receipts, and they'll be like, nope, 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 nope. You're wrong. Here's why. So that's going to be fun to watch. I mean, Trump could do that occasionally. Trump, every so often, reminds me of a blind boxer. He knows he needs to take a swing at somebody, but he can't realize who he ought to throw the punch at. You know what I mean? He, He's probably one of the ver verbally one of the best punchers and counter punchers in American politics. But every so often you sit there and go, God, why? Just why are you doing this? But Carrie Lake, I'm very excited to see what that what that lady can do in the next few years. That's gonna be fun to watch. So speaking of that, now there's been a big story going on at the moment of Trump making comment about DeSantis. And after that comment, there's a lot of Republicans now who are all of a sudden no longer supporting Trump because of the vaccine rules he did, Operation Warp Speed and other stuff that he also did not like not doing enough to fight the lockdowns. As a conservative yourself, when you look at that drama right now, do you think it is time for the GOP to move away from Trump? And do you think that DeSantis would be a better candidate than Trump for 2024, even though DeSantis has had some strange accusations and strange connections with him? Oh, that's a lot of stuff to unbox. Um, all right, well, let's start with the first one. Should the, should the GOP move away from Trump? My response to that is no, not if they want to win an election at the presidential level. And there's a reason for that. Trump, for all of his flaws, and God knows there are many, can do one what you, thing. What would you say was his biggest flaw? Uh, fraud? <laughs> his ego. It's his strength and it's his weakness. His ego. Um... I, I get the fact that the man is proud and accomplished. I understand that. But sometimes in life, there's just some fights you ought to walk away from, and there's some fights that you take on. He doesn't know the difference, at least from the outside looking in. Okay. But to get back to your question, Trump, there's one thing he could do right now that nobody else in the GOP can. There are voters in America 
who have washed their hands of both parties. They're like, I hate the Democrats. I hate the Republicans. I'm not going to participate. The hell with it. In 2016, Donald Trump brought them back into the voting process. He got them engaged again in American politics because they looked at Trump and they said, for all of his flaws, that man represents me more than Hillary Rodham Clinton does. They looked at Trump and said, this guy could actually keep his word. This is a businessman. This is somebody who's made a payroll. He's run companies. They said, you know what? What what have I got to lose? You know, I'll never forget Trump's went into Detroit, gave a speech, and he and he looked at the camera and said, Hey, African American voters in America, vote for me. What the hell have you got to lose? That that singular message, among other things, got people who have been disengaged for years to come back. Now, here's the fascinating part about this. 2018, when the Democrats took the House and the Senate, those voters didn't come out to vote. Why? Trump wasn't on the ballot. 2020, uh, they came back out to vote in hordes. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough. 2022, those voters, Trump's not on the ballot. They didn't come out to vote. Now, there's a lot of reasons why the Republicans did not do well in the midterms. Don't get me wrong. That wasn't the only thing. But that's one significant portion of it. (coughs) Excuse me. If the Republicans want to win, they've got to have Trump on the ballot. Now, let's flip the coin and get a look at DeSantis. DeSantis is is Trump without the rough edges. One man is the present. The other man is the future. I have argued for a long time that Trump and DeSantis ought to be on the same ticket together. Let Trump run for the presidency, take DeSantis as the Veep, and, you know, take your chances. You've got nothing to lose. I mean, I have if- some people who actually recommended that Trump should be Speaker of the House and DeSantis should run. That'd be an interesting notion. I mean, because th- honestly, there's no law that would prevent Trump from not being Speaker. Because technically speaking, you do not have to be an elected representative to be the Speaker of the House of Representatives. You just have to be chosen. That's it. Would Trump do it? I doubt it. He wouldn't want the headache. Uh, <clears throat> but to get back to the point, right now, the argument that's going on, Trump's being Trump. He's taking some shots at DeSantis, took a shot at Yunkin. I'm not so sure that these are shots at them as much as their shots at the people who are pushing them forward. Right now, there's a very interesting behind-the-scenes civil war going on in the Republican Party. And it has been really for, I guess now, six years. Because when Trump came in, the Republican establishment realized very quickly he would not be good for business. Now, I say not good for business, meaning not good for their business. The business of enriching themselves, enriching their interests, enriching their friends, etc. Trump wanted to get, you know, all the troops out from around the world, bring them home. Trump didn't want to get involved in foreign wars. He didn't want to be involved in every cotton-picking military conflict all around the world. Not these guys. The Civil War basically gets down to this. Whether they like to admit it or not, Donald Trump is the leader of the Republican Party. They can't stand that fact. They want control back. My question is, okay, let's assume you didn't have Trump. Would you really be any better off? 
you had Mitt Romney, you had John McCain, you had George W. Bush. How much better off are you now than you were before? The reason, in part, that Donald Trump did so well in 2016, mowing down the Republican field for president, is that, frankly, none of them could do what he did. Everybody talks about, oh, the strength of this candidate or the strength of that candidate. No, no, no. If they were that strong, Trump never would have got as far as he did. So I just, to me, if the Republicans want to win a national election again at the presidential level, for right now, they have to have Trump on the ticket. Now, the longer-term question becomes, all right, either because of age or constitutional term limit, Trump's not there. How do you reach the Trump voter? I think DeSantis could do that. If he will or not is the million-dollar question. Mm -hmm. So, I just also got another question for you here. Now, let's say I'm someone right now because I'm... There's a lot of people who, in the last two years, like I said, they've lost their support for Trump right. for these exact reasons. So let's say this. I'm a critic coming up to debate you and okay. criticizing Trump's things. Okay. So these are the big things that he gets criticized on. Operation Warp Speed. Right. Zero liability for farmer. Didn't fire Fauci. Didn't pardon Assad. Ostrate, uh, Ostr um, sorry, didn't pardon Snowden, sorry. He actually also, like, what was it with Assange? It was something with Assange. And he also did the bombing of Syria, and he also helped, you know, fund the genocide of Yemen for Saudi Arabia, which is something that Trump never should have done. And he also kept bombing Somalia. When people give you those accusations of Trump, what do you say to that? They're absolutely right. Oh, I wow, mean, really? No, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, believe me, I mean, I may be a doctrinaire conservative, but I'd like to think I'm honest enough of a critic that, you know, yeah, there's things Trump did that just absolutely made me tear my hair out. Okay. Especially on domestic policy. Trump should have realized very early on he was being played by Fauci and Burks. And all the rest of and the... And Mike Pence. Mike Pence yeah. is just awful. Absolutely yeah. awful. He was. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Trump should have realized he was being played. And I also think... and also, when the whole thing with Iran was happening, I actually heard it was Ron Paul's son that actually there was a lot of the Democrats were trying to get Trump to go to war with Iran. It wasn't... It, they were actually really putting him on. And it was actually Ron Paul's son if you do believe in this, who actually stopped, you know, Trump from going to war with Iran. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, there is a certain portion of the foreign policy establishment in Washington, DC that would love nothing better than to have us in a perpetual war with somebody and particularly a war with Iran. That would be catastrophically stupid Especially with all the reasons. oil reserves they have and how they're not, you know, connected to the United States dollar. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, believe me, I, there are criticisms that I have of Trump. And, <clears throat> and you know, it's, when someone brings this stuff up to me, I'm like, yeah, you're right. He screwed up. He royally screwed up. Uh, to go back to to the pandemic, I think by the time Trump realized he was being played, he was so far in, there wasn't a whole lot he could do about it. Now, looking back on it, should he have fired Fauci inside of a week? Yeah, absolutely. Even when he realized he was being played, even when he realized he was so far in. I think Trump got and took some really bad advice. He's like, look, we can't destabilize the country right now. We have to look like we're on top of this thing. We have to look like we're in control. You just can't go firing people will-nil. He went along with it to his detriment. You know, I mean, believe me, if you could ever get Trump to be totally honest about it, 
he, you know, he said, if you had to do over again, would you have changed X, Y, and Z? He'd be like, yeah. Yeah. Because that period from March of 20 to the day of the election did him in. It just it, it set in motion everything that led to his political defeat. So, yeah, he did it to himself, you know. And unfortunately, the country suffers because of it. So, speaking of this French port, tell me more about your background. So, you started in American politics when you were 17. What was the first debate that you remember watching? And who was your favorite politician growing up? And your favorite, you know, quote that they used in their favorite, like, you know, that and the type of, you know, favorite book that you love to read that really inspired you to get into politics now and and see the lies of the establishment and the elite the first presidential debate <clears throat> that i can remember watching was governor michael dukakis against then vice president george herbert walker bush what year was this 1988 yes i'm really dating myself here to tell you how long I've been around watching this stuff, I tell you. Um, <laughs> as far as the books that got me interested in politics, oh gosh. He's passed on now, but I recommend any of his works to anybody. Uh, Dr. Charles Colson, who was uh counsel to the president nixon uh let's see the, the interesting thing about my political evolution is for like maybe the first 20 years of my political following i was a doctrinaire conservative when we were attacked at 9 11 you know i said hey these guys need to pay whatever we got to do let's do it i backed the iraq war when Robert Byrd came out against the Iraq war, I didn't go so far as to call him a traitor, but I was like, how could you possibly do this? We know Saddam is tied in with all this somehow. And then when we didn't start finding weapons of mass destruction, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a second. Something's wrong here. Cause this was the whole pretext on which they sold us that we got to go in. And then as the years went by, it's like, oh my gosh, how many different lies were we sold and we bought off on in the name of patriotism and country? And it just, you know, I was a Republican from the time that I registered to vote when I was 18 years old until January 21st. 2021 i am now a registered independent i will never go back to the republican party again because i used to be able to tell the good guys from the bad guys now i can really tell who they are and there's not a whole lot of good guys on either side frankly from my perspective um but yeah there's somebody else going back to your question about what books did I read growing up, PJ O'Rourke. If you have never read any of his stuff, oh my gosh, you need to. PJ he passed away about a year ago now. Was a libertarian who liked his cigars, liked his whiskey, but my God, could that man write? He was brilliant. He used to joke around that he was the token conservative at Rolling Stone magazine. And he's written all kinds of books. I think one of the, the most re one of the most recent ones of his that I read is called Don't Vote. It only encourages the bastards. <laughs> oh, P PJ was great. Absolutely great. And he had a very unique eye for foreign affairs because that's what he used to cover for Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, there's a book of his that I will recommend to anybody. It's a little bit dated now, but it's really good. All the Trouble in the World. 
he goes and does an analysis, a historical analysis, by the way, of all the hot spots that were going on in the world. And just great read and funny. Oh, my gosh, funny. So, yeah, if, if ever you happen to find anything of PJ O'Rourke, read it. It's great. So, Front Porch, before we finish off today, um, what would you like to say to our audience? And what advice would you give to future Americans who are um, – losing hope in the country and what is your thoughts on the potential of America maybe going into civil war if something dodgy was to happen in 2024 and the potential of like nations like Texas and Florida splitting and New Hampshire? My advice to the American people, <clears throat> excuse me, stay engaged. Do not let these people grind you into dust what's being done now is in part i would argue psychological the elite want people to think that they have no power i will argue the power has always been in the hands of the american people they just have to exercise it now does that mean we can cure everything in one election or one presidential election no we got here by a whole series of bad decisions made by a bunch of self-serving politicians on both sides. It's going to take a while to turn this thing around. With regard to the possibility of civil war, I pray it does not happen. I think there is a possibility somewhere down the line it could because the country is becoming more and more divided. You know, red states, blue states. Red states are becoming more red. Blue states are becoming more blue. I honestly thought that Lee Zeldin in New York State had a chance to win the governor's race. If he had, I'm not saying New York would have turned around tomorrow, but at least... What is your opinion on Larry Sharp? I would have loved to have seen Larry Sharp on a debate stage with Hochul and Zeldin. I think that libertarians, and particularly, particularly Larry, I got to see Larry on an episode of uh, Chrissy Bear's uh, Yeah, show. I, I've, I've actually had Larry on my show before, and I think he would be absolutely fantastic. And he also did, uh, they actually, what they did is, since Larry wasn't on the governor's uh, thing, which was absolutely ridiculous, he should have been yeah, on agree. the podium. And I think that Larry, the points he brought up when I brought him on my uh, show was brilliant. And I think that personally, I would vote for Larry for the president of the United States. I think he would be great as the United States president. And, and I think the fact that Larry, he points out a lot of, you know, flaws in the system, that the third party should get more of a chance and he would be great. So back to that, like you were saying. Yeah, I think I think Larry would have been fantastic on a debate stage because I've I've heard him speak before. And if you take what he what he says and you run it through an analysis, ninety five percent of it is pure, just pure common sense. I have no problem with Larry. The problem is in New York State, it is the rules are set up in such a way that third party candidates very rarely get to be on a debate stage and it's so difficult for them to get on the ballot. But Larry, I thought Larry was great. You know, if I were living in New York state, I'd have voted for him. Absolutely. I would have, uh, <clears throat> but to go back to your question. My advice to people is stay engaged. Do not give up. Focus on local races, your school boards, your city councils, your state legislatures, your governor's races, if we're going to turn this thing around, we're going to do it from the bottom up. And it will take time. But if we win the culture, we'll win the politics. And and that's another thing. And, and I've learned this lesson now more so in the past couple of years than I ever realized. Andrew Breitbart said it best. Politics is downstream from culture. When conservatives abandoned culture and just gave it up to the Democrats, 
they almost seal their fate. You wonder why we have woke running amok in businesses? You wonder why it's running amok in schools? You wonder why it's running amok everywhere? You gave up on it. You gave up on culture, and now the culture is biting you in the rear end. Stay engaged. Be involved. Don't give it up. If these are the things you truly believe in, if these ideals are what you're willing to teach your children, then let them be lived out daily in your local communities. You'll make your community stronger. You'll make your city stronger, your state, and then inevitably your country. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on my show, Front Porch Conservative. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here. I've really enjoyed it. Where can people find you? <clears throat> I am on Twitter, Front Porch Conservative. I'm working on starting a YouTube channel at some point in the future. I'm hoping maybe early January. Uh, I'm also on Instagram. I'm also on uh, Rumble. No, no videos are uploaded yet, nothing like that. But I'm hoping to start easing into the social media water here because, you know, and I have to give a shout out to two people. One of them is Eric July. The other is Chrissy Mayer. And both of them made the statement, you know, get in where you fit in. If you have a voice, use it. Am I the most brilliant analyst of American politics? Oh, God, no. God, no. But I have things to say. Why shouldn't I say them? I mean, I mean, if YouTube wants to shut me down, if I start speaking my mind, okay, that's fine. There's Rumble. There's Odyssey. There's other places where people could actually speak their mind and get a message out. You know, so I think it's a glorious time to be alive. Challenging, frightening, but glorious. So looking forward to being in the middle of all of it. You know, Front Porch, I really think you would do a great job with your podcast. And I really think what you should do with your podcast, you should have set like, talk about history of like your knowledge of what it is to be a conservative and like what you've experienced during your lifetime and have different guests. And I think you would, I really wish you the best of luck, bro, with that. I think you would do a fantastic job of the podcast. And I absolutely recommend everybody to support the front porch conservative, you know, when he starts his own podcast. Thank you, sir. I genuinely appreciate it. And yeah, this interview has been absolutely fantastic. You have been absolutely wonderful. And you know, best of luck to you and everything. And if there's anything I can ever do to help you do, just let me know. Well, thank you for coming on Front Sports Concerted. God bless you. And I just want to say to everybody, thank you for joining the Welsh Republic podcast 74 today. I'll be back with more shows this week. Have a nice day, everybody. Take care.